So, so I'm, I'm coming at this from a very practical angle. Um, and in fact, um, the question could almost be what brings me as an SME to this topic um, and in fact I thought I would share with you the journey that we took in coming to some of these topics and now coming into this field um, and share some of the the lessons and some of the impact that we have found some of the things we learned so very briefly about us who are we so call up systems is we are a Swiss business incorporated in Zurich in, in fact with a European team, so we have offices in, in Berlin and in, in the UK, and um, a distributed team within the EU, strictly within the EU, actually, and Switzerland. Um, and uh, so what we do, I think that's the old slides, anyway. Um, um, so what we do is collaboration software, right? So um, what traditionally you know as groupware. Um, so the whole, the whole, you know, email, calendaring, task management, file cloud, notes on, in the web, of course, and on mobile and across all the platforms and Windows and Linux and what have you, right? Um, but for us, the central or one of the most important points why people choose our solution is security. We, um, in fact, if you look at our timeline, um, which is impossible to read at this size, I apologize, but all the way to the left you will see that um, we started out as um, a development for the German Federal Office for IT Security, the BSI. That is where Colab originates. Um, in fact, the BSI is using Colab until today. Um, they commissioned it back in the day because they required a solution that they could trust and trust for them was defined, among other things, as open and fully auditable and fully open source and fully open standards based and interoperable and all these things. In 2010, we spun that out into its own product-based business, which is Colab Systems AG, which is what I am the CEO of. Um, and we've, uh, meanwhile, of course, grown the business, so that's good. Um, we have now Fortune 50 is using it, the city of Munich is using it. Um, and we joined this year, in fact, the Open Power Foundation. Now, the Open Power Foundation is, is a hardware-based thing, and we are strictly a software company, right? Um, so a lot of people ask, why? Like, why have you done that? Like, what was your motivation to do this? Um, and that brings me to the topic of security, which is central to us and our users, and trust. And in order to get a bridge over to that topic, I thought I'd put up a picture of a bridge. Um, and in fact, this is um, the Trift Bridge um, in the Bernese Oberland in Switzerland. It's the highest um, like glacier spanning bridge that you can walk over and whatever. Um, and not visible, but in tiny specks at the end of that bridge, you'll see my family. Um, and the, 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 the point is you that... The first. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> exactly. But um, see, the, the, the point there being that um, security is tricky, right? Security requires us to have trust and confidence in certain things. We need have to have certain base assumptions in order to have security, otherwise we go insane. If I wanted to verify every single thing that I rely on every single time when I'm doing it, right, um, I would not be able to do that. Um, in this case, I have to trust the steel that was used, right? It was manufactured to proper specification. The bridge was solidly engineered. There was probably some inspector that, that had to actually approve that building and so on and so forth, right? All these steps that society put in place um, that I implicitly take for granted um, that I need to trust in order to have security. Because when I'm standing up there, just having hiked the 1,000 meters up or whatever, um, to this point to cross now, I cannot verify all of that. Not at that point. And if I try to, I, I mean, there would not be enough time in the day. The, the sun would have set long before I've ever, ever crossed the bridge. So trust is ultimately central to security. I cannot have one without the other. The question, however, is, and that is always critical, how do I arrive at trust? Right? Where does my trust in things come from? And there's two fundamentally different models for that. One is belief. 
I can just believe things and then trust in them. Um, it's, you know, it's a valid model, you know, fair enough. Um, it is one model at which people arrive at trust. I myself happen to also be a scientist and in fact a physicist um, by background. Um, so personally I usually take a different approach um, which is you know, in this case, I've put up Richard Feynman because all physicists are fans of Feynman. I mean, it comes with the territory. It's like there's no one that does not adore him um, because he could explain things in a very simple way and um, put big truths eloquently. And one of them is what I cannot create, I do not understand. For scientists, arriving at trust means being able to dissemble it, to put it back together, to open it up, to understand what is happening underneath. And only once I have had that process, and once that process is possible, can I actually quantify and verify and make an informed decision about trust. Trust comes from the ability to study it. Now, in technology, that would be very much the approach I would advocate. Um, however, it is not always the approach that is taken. And I've, I can pick many examples. One of them, in this case, is on the hardware level. Um, we have a dominant architecture right now in IT that is extremely closed, extremely proprietary. It is everywhere, but we do not exactly know what's going on in it. And it's so complex that no one really understands it. Um, that, not just to me, but to quite a few people who are into IT security, is an issue. People are concerned about this. is just a headline from one of the articles about these kind of questions. Um, we cannot study it. We cannot understand it. And because it is highly proprietary, no one is even allowed to engage with it. So to us, writing software that needs to run on hardware, and we write the software to the highest possible specification of trust that we can establish, and we open it all up. We are a completely open source company, right? There's nothing hidden, nothing secret. You can see it all because we believe that that is how you can arrive at trust. Now, that same thing is not true for the hardware on which it runs most of the time. And of course, the hardware has a dramatic impact on the security and trust that we can place on the software. And that was when we started to look for alternatives. And that's when we actually discovered Open Power. I mean, our approach to open power, our entry into open power um, through, in fact, a business partnership with IBM at the time, um, was that we realized there's an architecture here that is actually open. I mean, it is unbeknownst to most people, but the Open Power Foundation is an open membership foundation where you can have access to the specifications of the processor, of the firmware, so you have the hardware with the firmware, you can run the, the software on top, you can have a completely open stack. And you can even build onto it, you can innovate onto it. Um, when you think about it, it is strange that the biggest steps in innovation we have seen in the past two decades in the hardware realm were mostly in the area of more gigahertz, more cache, more RAM. That's a very small step incremental approach to innovation, which is fair enough, but it is strange that nothing else but that has happened for so long. Now, Open Power, and I, I was at the Open Power Summit in Europe, in fact, in Barcelona, um, we see something different happen because the Open Power membership base, and I've, I've thrown it up there, I mean, it's kind of, you know, all the logos get very tiny at, at, because there's just uh, hundreds of members by now. Um, we see different things happen now. Um, so you see now Google work with Rackspace together to define the cloud platform of the future that they plan to use in their own data centers. They're not planning to buy these boxes from IBM because they said, no, we don't want you to buy our boxes. We actually want to build them ourselves, which is fair enough, right? They want the control and understand why they want it. But you see a lot of universities, you see a lot of, you know, in fact, um, high-performance computing centers engaging with the power platform because it has incredibly strong benefits, technologically speaking, for high-performance scenarios. Um, it's very, very strong in compute. Now, 
you also see Chinese companies, um, Israeli companies, you see the entire world coming together on a business level, and US, of course, a lot of the US companies, coming together to actually build that new platform. The interesting idea here that is behind this is that with some nudging from Google, IBM actually understood that there is a value in creating an open innovation ecosystem. Um, one where everyone can participate and where they realize that they would alone not be able to bring that power technology to the point that it could make a serious dent into an Intel dominated market, but that if they went the open approach, that might change dramatically. And so suddenly in the Open Power Foundation, we see new things happen. We see things happening in dramatically new and different ways. They redefine the way in which storage interacts with compute, in which I.O. interacts with network. Um, the, the actual interface layers between these different components start to change. And suddenly you see scenarios where you have orders of magnitude that are like a factor of 200, 500, 1,000 times better than traditional architectures for specific use cases. And it even it doesn't end there. So at the Open Power Summit in the United States, which I believe was in April, um, a bunch of them just sat together around a table and came up with this interface idea for like how could we reshape the way that this works so we can define new scenarios for working with the data and the storage and the I.O. Um, and they said, you know, what if we had this specification? And they called it copy. It's an open copy. And they pushed this out in October this year. I mean, think about this, right? From April to October. I mean, we're talking like industry giants, like innovating at a speed that is light speed compared to what's happened in the years before. And they created this open ca copy organization where you see suddenly even AMD involved. AMD traditionally focusing on creating Intel-based chips, right? Suddenly coming into this consortium, and again, an open consortium and open innovation framework, which is a dramatically new way of approaching this that for us, at least, was incredibly fascinating. And politically, from my personal perspective, I think there is a value here. There's a value in openness combined with control and build your own. I believe firmly in open innovation ecosystems because no matter how much money we spend on research in Europe, we will never have all the smart people in Europe. Just like the US will never have all the smart people in the US and no company will ever have all the smart people in its own house. I mean, all, all the companies around the table, all the countries around the table need to understand we will never have them all. Never. So what you want, I believe, is you want your smart people to be able to work with all the other smart people in an open fashion that allows for an open innovation to happen, an innovation that does not need to ask for permission, an innovation that actually can happen in unexpected ways, and then build that open innovation ecosystem, be a full and equal partner in, in it internationally. It needs to be world spanning, and if we ever go across this planet, it needs to be you know, solar system spanning, whatever, but everyone who has a smart brain should be part of this. And then we want to be able to leverage the actual results of that ecosystem, of that knowledge gained, and where it is sensible for us, take control because it may be relevant for policy, strategic, whatever other purposes, but do this in a way that we stay part of this ecosystem. And I think that is the balance that we should aim for because that is how we can actually accelerate our knowledge at the same time make sure the benefit happens for our various economies. And so Colab ultimately then joined that foundation because, well, very frankly, we live in an innovation ecosystem world, right? Open source, which is where we come from, is a world of, of open collaboration. We work on technologies that we all use together with our competitors and our partners. Um, we all benefit from that. And we understand that participation is what shapes these ecosystems of innovation. It is coming to the table and participating, which is why that's what we've done. And ultimately, um, so 
without wanting to offend IBM, um, but um, when IBM tries to communicate something, it tends to become a very well-kept secret. Um, I'm, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, but uh, like for some reason, you, uh, there, there is a problem of getting the word out. Like the Open Power Foundation was completely unknown to so many people. In, fa in fact, I mean, so the Open Power Foundation and um, and the open source community should be natural allies because they have the same values, the same approaches, the same principles. Um, yet the open source community had never heard of the Open Power Foundation um, to the largest extent that I knew of. So we wanted to actually help spread the word because um, you know, we felt we could get that word out there and we felt there was value in getting this because we believed that that collaboration should be happening. So we also did like a little event series, with, in this case with Red Hat and IBM to actually inform people that that kind of thing can happen. Because at the end of the day, the reason we are involved is very simple. Our users want to be able to collaborate in confidence, which means we need to give them a full stack at some point. Um, and we start where we can, and we work our way forward. That's how we do it. Thank you.